So I wanted to come to the floor today to bring you to, to your attention an ongoing human rights issue that weighs heavily on me and, and should weigh heavily on all of us. Every day, people are unjustly detained, they're tortured, publicly shamed and murdered, often at the hands of their own government. And here's what their crimes are. Simply disagreeing with the government. Disagreeing whether through journalism, through blogging, through peaceful organizing, or for simply being in a different religion. In jail cells all around the world sit innocent men and women who wanted nothing more than to freely express themselves in the society in which they live. The vast number of political prisoners held by repressive regimes is a sobering reminder of how much work remains to uphold basic human rights and advance democratic values. From Cuba to China, from Turkey to Saudi Arabia, people are suffering for exercising the freedoms that our Creator gave them. Now I say the phrase political prisoners, but I want to remind you that these prisoners oftentimes are just ordinary people like us. People who dream of a greater future for their country. People who envision a better life for their families and their loved ones. They're journalists, they're bloggers, many are human rights activists, educators, some are politicians. But we also have pastors and mothers and fathers and students. America traditionally has been a voice for those oppressed. We as a country, as a people, have engaged in what Ronald Reagan once described as, quote, the age-old battle for individual freedom and human dignity, end quote. It is unacceptable for America to forsake this legacy today, to turn its back on our fellow human beings who are losing their lives or being imprisoned for exercising their fundamental God-given freedoms. So this is why last September, my office launched a social media campaign we call Expression Not Oppression. I should say hashtag expression, not oppression. Each week we highlight a different political prisoner or prisoner of conscience in an effort to bring and put a human face on the suffering inflicted by the many repressive regimes around the world. Today I wanted to come here to share the stories of some of the people we've championed in the past year. In 2014, Tibetan writer and blogger Dawa Somo was detained for breaking China's cyber laws by publishing articles that the government considered politically sensitive. To this day, she's missing. Today, China is one of the most repressive countries in the entire world. In Cuba, matters are just as serious, if not worse. Beatings, public acts of shame, and termination of employment are well-known consequences of disagreeing with the Castro regime. The Castro regime has re-arrested almost all of the 53 political prisoners it released as part of the supposed normalization of relations that President Obama undertook at the end of 2014. Remember the 53 names on that list of people they were going to let go as part of the normalization? Virtually all 53 of them have since then been rearrested. The Cuban people know they deserve better. Groups throughout the island have continuously stood up to the face of repression. And one of the most prominent is a group, the Ladies in White, or in Spanish, Damas de Blanco. Many of the women who make up this group are the wives and relatives of jailed dissidents, protesting the unlawful imprisonment of their husbands and sons and brothers and fathers. So each Sunday following Catholic Mass, the ladies in white take to the streets in a silent march. They are often harassed, arrested, and even beaten by the Cuban government. In fact, just last Sunday, the leader of the ladies in white was arrested. She will soon be placed on trial and could face between three months and five years in prison. But this sort of treatment hasn't stopped them. Week after week, these women continue to protest the Castro regime and fight for the freedom of their nation and of their loved ones. In the disaster that has become Venezuela due to its incompetent tyrant leader, Leopoldo uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, not Leopoldo Lopez, that's the gentleman I'm going to speak about in a moment. They're incompetent Nicolas Maduro, a tyrant who's an incompetent clown. But uh, in Venezuela, we've seen one of the most prominent Venezuelan opposition leaders, Leopoldo Lopez, arrested and sentenced to 13 years and nine months in prison on charges of terrorism, murder, and grievous bodily harm, and public incitement. Sounds like pretty serious charges. Here's the reality. Leopoldo Lopez, who was the governor of a prominent state in the country, was imprisoned for advocating for a constitutional, democratic, and peaceful change in the Venezuelan government. That's why he's in jail. 
Since the Venezuelan government's crackdown on demonstrators and political opponents began in the year 2014, in February of 2014, dozens of innocents have been killed, thousands beaten and targeted for intimidation, and hundreds more jailed. Not to mention, most of these political prisoners in Venezuela are men. Do you know what happens? Do you know what happens to the wives of these men in jail when, uh, when they go visit their spouses in prison? They are often strip searched by male guards in front of their families as the act of ultimate humiliation. This is what we're dealing with in Venezuela. In late March of this year, the Venezuelan National Assembly passed a law that would extend amnesty to more than 70 political prisoners in Venezuela because they had an election. And in that election, even though they always steal elections in Venezuela, the, the uh, Maduro government does, the loss was so overwhelming they couldn't steal this election. And so the opposition won control of the Venezuelan National Assembly and they passed a law that extended amnesty to more than 70 political prisoners who are in Venezuelan jail simply because they opposed Maduro, not because they committed a crime. And to no one's surprise, the tyrant Nicolas Maduro promised to block it. And as he claimed, because he claimed it was unconstitutional. Only a few weeks later, he proposed the law to the, he, he sent the law to the Supreme Court and urged them to overturn it. Four days after his request, the Supreme Court, a Supreme Court which is illegitimate because it is completely stacked with his cronies, granted him his wish and declared the law unconstitutional. And so this is why there's been a coup d'etat in Venezuela. That's why the democracy has been canceled, why this is now a tyranny. You have an elected National Assembly being ignored. You have a Supreme Court being stacked with cronies that are basically a rubber stamp for the tyrant. And the result is the gross violation of human rights, most prominently the case of Leopoldo Lopez. In Pakistan, we've seen proponents of religious freedom murdered for criticizing blasphemy laws. In March of 2011, Shabazz Bhatti, Pakistan's federal minister of minority affairs, and by the way, the only Christian to serve in Pakistan's cabinet, was shot to death by the Pakistani Taliban outside of his mother's home. Five years have passed. The Pakistani government has failed to bring his murderers to justice and have failed to attempt to reform the blasphemy law that continues to encourage violence, murder with impunity, and the marginalization of religious minorities. As a result, numerous other prisoners of conscience in Pakistan suffer behind bars. Finally, as President Obama visited Vietnam this week, a Vietnamese blogger and human rights activist named Nguyen Hu Vinh was languishing in a state prison for having voiced the wrong opinions about his government. These examples are just a tiny window into the world of political oppression that exists today. Their cases are only a few that we have highlighted in our hashtag expression not oppression campaign. I'd like to submit to the, for the record a complete list of all of the political prisoners we have featured. They span the globe from Angola to Laos, from Iran to Burma. All these men and women were seen as a threat to the leaders of their nations. But I, and I agree you do as well, see them as heroes. Just because they aren't fighting on a battlefield doesn't mean they aren't putting their lives on the line for the greater good of their people and their nation. In a country where we are free to express ourselves, it's hard to grasp this risk. It is difficult to imagine a prominent journalist in the United States fearing for his or her life solely for doing their job. Or to fathom a popular blogger facing the death penalty solely for expressing their thoughts well, it should be just as unimaginable to jail independent journalists in the rest of the world. The families of the prisoners I mentioned today have also paid a price. Most of these families, they spend their days and nights unsure if they will ever again see their loved ones. There are no visiting hours. There are no phone calls. In the cases of many on death row, their families often find out they've been executed on the state-run media. Children are being left to grow up on their own, wondering whether their mother or their father has gone, wondering if they will ever feel their embrace again. But there are reasons to be hopeful, for when free people speak out, it can make a difference in the lives of the oppressed. As a result of numerous international efforts, including our hashtag expression, not oppression campaign, some prisoners of conscience have been released from jail and reunited with their families, although they may not be able to return to their home countries. We saw this in the case of the Cuban street artist known as El Sexto, who was freed last October after 10 months in prison. 
We saw it in the case of prominent Azerbaijani human rights activist Leila Yunus and her husband Arif, who were released from jail only on the grounds of deteriorating health, but have since been allowed to travel to the Netherlands for medical care and to be reunited with their daughter. Once released, many have agreed that their advocacy on their behalf was a great encouragement to them and their families, and by the way, likely resulted in better treatment or even a speedier release. A few years ago, uh, famed Soviet dissident Natan Sharansky testified on Capitol Hill, and he said of himself and fellow prisoners of conscience in the USSR that we could never survive even one day in the Soviet Union if our struggle was not the struggle of the free world. We should take to heart the sentiment, he expressed, and embrace the struggle of political prisoners who languish unjustly as I speak. We must do everything we can to raise awareness of the brutality taking place in repressive regimes around the world. We must not forget the hundreds of people who are being tortured or deprived of their lives for trying to bring freedom to their lands while illegitimate governments desperately cling to power. Even with our strategic allies such as Saudi Arabia, we can never stop insisting that they show respect for women, for all human life, and the God-given fundamental rights of all people. Oppressed peoples do not stay oppressed forever. Repressive governments do not stay in power forever. Inevitably, the human yearning to be free and to achieve a better life for oneself and one's family, eventually, it cannot be restrained. Today, I pray for those who are victims of their own government. I pray for the release of prisoners of conscience and their families. And I pray that our own country stands firmly by its principles in calling for the sacred right of every man and woman and child to be free. Lastly, on a point of per personal privilege, I'd like to take a moment to thank Mag Maggie Doherty, who has been a valuable member of my legislative team for the past five years and specialized in issues of human rights around the world. Her expertise, and just as importantly, her passion on these issues, has been invaluable to me and to my staff. Her service to our country, to the people of Florida, to the Senate, and to many individuals and families, like the ones I just mentioned, who suffer around the world, it will not be forgotten. So I thank you for your service, Maggie, and I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum.